place. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. If my son would bring me my stuff, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. How many ready for the word tonight? Amen. Uh, go ahead and grab your Bible and uh, turn with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 17. And we will start with uh, verse number 20. While everybody is finding that, we'd like to uh, welcome all those uh, that are watching online. And uh, uh, we're sad you can't be with us, but we're glad you're logging on to get the word tonight. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Now, y'all got to pray for me uh, because of the uh, subject at hand tonight. It's going to be very hard for me to remain seated. So if I don't stay in my seat, y'all just point at me and say, sit down. All right, because I need to sit tonight. But uh, we're, we're talking about tonight, uh, uh, and after much prayer and going back and forth with God on this, uh, I just could not get away from this topic. And so tonight, I want to talk to you about the four manifestations of the kingdom. The four manifestations of the kingdom. Verse 20 of Luke chapter 17 says these words. Now, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, how many know Pharisee? And I know quite a few. Uh, when Jesus uh, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom is within you. Say that with me. The kingdom is within me. So I want to talk to you about the four manifestations. Now, let's be clear, there are more. But these were the four the Holy Spirit really led me to talk about tonight. The four manifestations of the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that the kingdom of God is not an external thing because the kingdom of God is where? Within us. Uh, you know, people do that all the time. Oh, oh, look, the kingdom is over there. Or look, the kingdom's over here. But the kingdom is not an external happening the kingdom is an internal change. And so I want to talk to you about what are the four manifestations of the kingdom. The kingdom is an internal work that manifests in external change. If anybody says to you that they have been brought into the kingdom, but they're no different after that than they were before that, something's missing. Because the kingdom is an internal work that gives an external change. Once you contact the kingdom of God, your life should be different. Should look different, should act different, should be different. It changes your appetite, amen? And so the kingdom is an internal work. We're all called to walk into the kingdom, but not just to walk in the kingdom, but to yield to the kingdom. It is not enough, so let me say it this way, coming into the kingdom is the same as Jesus being your Savior. Yielding to the kingdom is the same as Jesus being your Lord. See, a lot of people want Jesus to save them, but they don't want Jesus to tell them what to do. Say amen or ouch. How many love being told what to do? Oh, one person, two, two people. That's not what Jerry tells me, Dana. You better tell the truth in here. All right. We are called to walk in the kingdom, but we're also called to yield to the kingdom. And yielding to the kingdom opens us up for kingdom benefits. Right? Because God wouldn't tell us to do something if he didn't have a purpose for the instruction. But not only are we called to walk in the kingdom, we're, we're called to yield to the kingdom. 
because of all that God has placed on the inside of you and me. In other words, if you're going to be a kingdom person, you have to learn to live this way. Less of me, more of Him. Less of me, more of Him. Less of me, more of Him. We kind of had a similar conversation at a furniture store this morning because we had to sell all of our bedroom furniture in Ohio. And we are just at this point, we ain't looking for a whole bedroom suit. We just, we were looking for the right bed for, for where we're at in our lives right now. And my wife just kept saying, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? What, what about this one? What about that one? And finally, I just said, what do you want? I learned that from Pastor Jerry. You just, <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? Uh, in other words, babe. Less of what, look, I said, when I'm in this thing, my eyes going to be closed, right? I really don't care what it looks like. Do you like it? Less of what I want, because I'm more particular about the deck and the patio and all my barbecue equipment, right? Because when it comes to that, I don't ask her what she likes. I get what I like. So I'm just trying to say, you got the rest of the house. Just give me the deck and the patio. And so that, that is kind of a silly example of a spiritual truth. That when we come into contact with God over our lives, it can't be, well, I think this should happen. I think that should happen. I think, God, you should have done this then. You should be doing this now. It has to be less of us and more of him. Say that with me. Less of me, more of him. So what are the four manifestations? And again, I want to reiterate especially for anybody that might be watching this. Don't cut me off if you think that I missed something. These are the four the Holy Spirit told me to talk about tonight. There are so many more, but these are the four we want to focus on tonight. Four manifestations of the kingdom of God. Watch this, not externally, but first internally. If the, ki- if the kingdom is not at work inside, it cannot manifest outside. I'm going to give you an example. You cannot say we want revival in our church if first we haven't desired revival in our heart. Does that make sense to you? And so revival, the glory of God, however you want to say this, the kingdom of God has to have four manifestations at work on the inside so that they will then manifest on the outside. Does that make sense to you? Number one. The first manifestation of the kingdom of God is the rescue and restoration of all humanity. The rescue and restoration of all humanity. I'll never forget years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, somebody came to me and said, I want you to go to this meeting with me. I said, why? And they said, because it's kingdom. I said, explain to me why you say it's kingdom. Well, people are falling on the floor, people are getting healed, people are having their teeth filled with gold, there's angel sightings, uh, people are walking out of wheelchairs, throwing off their crutches, and, and it's kingdom. I said, really? I said, that sounds exciting. Answer me this, riddle me this, riddle me that. How many people are getting saved? Well, well, nobody. It's for the church. And I said, no, the kingdom is for lost humanity first. Right? And so that is what I call a believer's meeting. But it's not kingdom. Because the first manifestation that you have contacted the kingdom of God is lost humanity is rescued and restored. It's rescued and restored. It's only kingdom... I want you to write this down. It's only kingdom if people are being redeemed, restored, and renewed. That's it. It is only kingdom if people are getting rescued, redeemed, restored, and renewed. In other words, who they were is changing into who are, they are becoming. Does that make sense? And so... Uh, and there's there I, and nobody loves you know believers meetings more than I do but God didn't birth the church so that the church could just have believers meetings your bible still says these these words 
these signs shall follow them that believe. But he said that I give you these signs, watch this, not for you, but for the unbeliever. So the unbeliever will know that I am who I say I am. Does that make sense? The priority of the kingdom, I don't think we're going to get through all four tonight, so you know, come back next week. The priority of the kingdom is to redeem lost people, is to restore hurting people, and it is to renew people. How many can say that when you came in contact with the kingdom of God, you are not now who you were before that happened? Everybody should be shouting on that one. I say this all the time. Who I was is not who I am, and who I am is not who I am becoming, right? I hate to say this word in church, but I am evolving as a follower of Christ. Who I was is not who I am, and who I am is not who I will be because the kingdom is within me. If the kingdom's within me, I have to change. If I cussed before the kingdom, something should rise up in me that stops my cussing. Because the kingdom has to be greater, less of me, more of him. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to get saved and that night never mess up or ever say a bad word again. But I tell you what, years later, I ought to have victory and be an overcomer over who I was when I contacted the kingdom. Or rather, when the, contact, when the kingdom contacted me. God's heartbeat, I want you to say this with me, God's heartbeat is for the lost. God's heartbeat is for the hurting. God's heartbeat is for the dying. If it's true that God's heartbeat is for the lost, hurting, and dying, and if we are going to be kingdom people, then our heart must beat for the same. If, if God's heart beats for for the lost, beats for the hurting, beats, I'm going to tell you a funny story, beats for the dying. Our heart has got to beat for the same. This is the gospel truth. I ain't making this up. This happened. This happened to us the other day. And my immediate response was, dude, what's your problem? And then, and then immediately God said, my heart beats for that man. Why isn't yours? So God corrected me. So, so you've all heard me rave and rant about how wonderful the people of Fulton are, right? And how, wonder, and how much I love Mosers. So, we get the keys to the house. We need food, right? <laughs> my kids are, my daughter's dying over here because of what happened. And so, I told my wife, I said, listen, it is a waste of money and time to try to buy meat at Walmart. I said, I, it's worth the drive back from Jeff City into Fulton for us to get meat at Mosers. Number one, it tastes better. Number two, it's half the price. My wife, who's been in Ohio this whole time, looks at me and says, half. I said, let's go for a ride. So we go to Moser's. I'm telling you right now, and I am not like getting paid by Moser's to say this. They got some great prices on me, for real. Like, you should see my fridge. And as soon as the truck delivers my stuff, man, we're going to have some barbecue around my house. No one know what you're eating, but we'll be eating good barbecue. So... We go there, and we just load up on stuff and get, get what we can, and then obviously some things are more expensive, so you know we're trying to make the best decisions we can, and, uh, and so we've got a cart full, and now my kids, you know, my kids are just excited. They're giggling. They're laughing. They're messing with each other. The boys won't keep their hands off of each other, and, uh, and, and so we are kind of, and you know, they got things marked off six feet apart, you know, and so and so, and so we are all five of us actually in a conversation about something and this guy in front of us who to our fault was within probably two feet of us because we weren't paying attention we were just being a family how many knows what that's like so it's not just us and and the boys had got inching closer and inching closer to this guy he could obviously he could hear them the whole store could hear my voice and and suddenly, the man, he had a ponytail, he whipped around with that hair flying across the shoulder, and he goes, excuse me, could you back up? Could you just back up? <laughs> Six feet! <laughs> and then he turned around, and I was like, whoa. 
And my immediate, just, let me just be transparent, my immediate response was, what is this guy's problem? Like, wait, am I still in Fulton? Because I've never had the experience. And Jillian kind of whispered, she goes, that was not, what just happened? And, and so my wife just looks at me, and I can read her, Jerry, I can read her. Oh, Moser's is the place to go. Oh, <laughs> Fulton has the friendliest of people you've ever seen in your life. And I can read her. She's just looking at me, and the eyebrows are telling me the paragraphs. I know what you know. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to say anything. Your wife is next to you. It's okay. And so, and so we, 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 you know, he pays, he gets out. We go through the line. We pay for our food, and, and we go out the door. And we get to the vehicles, start loading up. And so my wife says, so my first experience at Moser's definitely looked nothing like yours. And, uh, and so for about three days, anytime one child gets too close to another child, they just go, could you please back up six feet? So at first I was like, and I think it's a natural response, and, I, and if you have the response, I just want you to know that it's normal, it's natural to say, dude, what is your problem? But the immediate response to the Holy Spirit to me was, before you judge him, you need to know what's inside him. Here's a revelation for you. Sinners sin. They make bad decisions. So do Christians, for that matter. They say things they're not supposed to say. So do Christians, for that matter. They carry attitudes that are not very pleasing. So do Christians, for that matter. And before we judge people, before we're harsh on people, maybe we need to learn what's inside people. You ever been to a restaurant that had the worst waitress you've ever had in your life? She was nasty. She was rude. Your food was cold and fill in the rest of the blanks. And then you say, I'm never coming back here. That was the worst waitress I've ever had in my life. But you also don't know what her spouse said to her last night or what her kids are doing or what financial pressure she's under. Does that make sense? Before we judge people, we should learn people. Somebody say, ouch or amen. amen. Thank you for saying ouch. Thank you. Amen. And it's something we all have to keep in mind. We all have to keep in mind. And understand that if the kingdom's within you, the kingdom's within you for a purpose. The other night we were at a restaurant because we didn't have groceries, so we're at a restaurant. And the whole time, from the first word, the Holy Spirit said, she's my daughter. And I, I just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. About two seconds later, Jillian looked at me and she goes, I think this one's a Christian. <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry. And so, and so we're sitting there and then the Holy Spirit says, I need you to pray for her. I went, now, now, hold on, now, now, hold on. I've got, you know, is this the reputation I want, right? What if I'm off? Because we miss it sometimes. What if I'm off? And then the more she served our table, man, I felt like I was going to get a whooping from the Holy Spirit if I didn't say something to this girl. So she, so she put the receipt down. We paid for it. And she goes, thank you so much for coming in. Y'all have a blessed day. And I went, okay. Sinners don't say y'all have a blessed day. So I just said, I just said, I said, man, before we go, is there anything we can pray for you for? Tears swelled up in her eyes. And, and then she forgot about every other table she was supposed to be serving. And she tells me her whole life story, how she's a mother of eight. Now you a mother of eight and you still pleasant? <laughs> Them's got to be some good children's. All right. Uh, uh, she, she talks about her husband and some things that they were going through and some pressures that she was under. And then she has to leave it all at the door when she comes in to serve people. She said, because I, this is not just a, go a job. God has me here serving people to be his light. And she goes, and then she told me some things I can't get into. Uh, and she, she said, she said, the fact that you would ask, can I pray for you? She goes, I can't tell you what that means. That's what I'm saying. When the kingdom is within you, when the kingdom is within you, it is not for you. The kingdom is within you, number one, for the rescue and restoration of all people. And she has some things she needs restored in her life. And so I told her, I said, we, we just moved here. We passed our church in Fulton. 
uh, and we just wanted to love on you and to let you know that if nobody else is, we're covering you in prayer. And I can't tell you what that meant to her, but I know, I know this, uh, something happened in her life that night. And I'm going to be honest with you, something happened in my life. Because when you understand, you might just be thinking, I'm going out to eat with my family. But what you don't understand is you're about to get set up for a kingdom moment. Amen? Say this with me. God's heartbeat is for the lost, for the hurting, for the dying. My heart must beat for the same. Number two. If the first manifestation is for the rescue and restoration of all humanity, the second manifestation is recovery of all things broken and stolen. The recovery of all things broken and stolen in your life and in the life of others. Joel chapter 2 and verse 25. Let's turn there and let's read that together. Actually, it's on the screen if you don't want to turn there. It says, For I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. Right? And then he goes on to talk about the, the locust, the stripping locust, the cutting locust, my great army which I sent among you. So he says here in Joel chapter 2 that a manifestation of the kingdom is the work of restoration. It is the work of restoration. To restore, he says this, and I need you to catch this tonight. If you don't catch anything else I say, hear what I'm about to say. He does not promise to restore moments. He says, I'll restore years. Years that have been lost. Years that have been stolen but hear me, years in your life that have been broken. A manifestation of the kingdom is God restores what is lost, what is stolen, and what is broken in your life. Why does he do that? Because those that receive restoration are to become representatives, or I like to say it this way, agents of restoration to have the testimony if he did it for me he'll do it for you does that make sense now to restore the years how many ever felt man there's something in my life it feels like it's been off for years there's something that's been missing for years or maybe you went through a time period in your life where you were broken and it and you weren't broken as a result of your decisions you were broken as a result of what others did, what others said. And if you let the enemy, he could plant a victim mindset on you because, let's be honest, what happened wasn't fair. And God says to us tonight that I'm not restoring you, I'm restoring the years. The years that were lost, the years that were stolen, the years where you felt like you were the clay on the potter's wheel and your life was spinning out of control, those years, the years where you, where you painfully prayed for a fruition or a manifestation of the promises of God, and yet it seemed like the more you prayed, the worse it got. And God says, but when the kingdom shows, those years I'll restore. The word restore means to bring back to its former original condition. In other words, it means to reproduce or reconstruct. Or another, well, I guess we could say that to, to, to rebuild. I know Jerry knows some stuff about restoring hot rods. I'm yet to see them, but I heard that he does that. Restore. So when, when somebody, let's just take it in, in, in the natural when somebody takes a vehicle and says, I'm going to restore this car, I'm going to restore this 69 Mustang, past appreciations in October, I just want to say that, I'm going to restore this Mustang, right? They're not, they don't say this, uh, 
Oh, oh, really? Tell me about the Mustang. Well, it's a 2020. It's in mint condition. It's beautiful. There's not a thing wrong with it, but I'm going to restore it. If there's nothing missing, if there's nothing broken, if there's nothing lacking, watch this, there's nothing to restore. Come on, somebody. Man, I wish I could jump around now. Why? Because to restore means to bring back to its former or original condition. So then if Jerry says, I'm, go- I'm about to restore a 1969 Ford Mustang for Pastor Tim for Pastor's Appreciation Day, then what he's saying is simply this. It's weathered. It's worn. It's beat down. She's got some dings in her. Maybe she's been in an accident or three. The engine won't start. The transmission dropped. The oil pan looks like a crushed can of Coke. But I'm going to restore it. What he's saying is, I'm going to take what's been through something. Man, I feel like shouting. I'm going to take what's had an injury. I'm going to take what is missing some parts. I'm going to take what it doesn't work anymore. I'm going to take what's broken. I'm going to take what's lacking. I'm going to take, watch this, I'm going to say it this way, what's messed up. And I'm going to restore it. So when I say I'm going to restore it, what I'm saying is, I'm, go- I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take out what don't work. Oh, come on, somebody. And I'm gonna put in what does work. Amen. I'm gonna give Pastor Tim so much horsepower that his wife would be scared to death to get in the front seat. I am going to restore this piece of machinery. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to work out the bumps. I'm going to work out the scratches. I'm going to work out all of the bruises that this vehicle's got. I'm going to take out the old upholstery. I'm going to redo it. I'm going to renew this vehicle. And won't Pastor Tim be excited come October on Pastor the Preach? Brother, you'll be the shortest service we have. Amen. Watch this. Why? Because what someone like Pastor Jerry can do with a piece of machinery... God does with us. God God does not take us and bring us into the kingdom so that He can say, you're fine the way you are. But He says, I'm going to take what don't work and root it out. I'm going to take what's bumped and bruised and dented and the oil of the Holy Spirit comes in and smooths it all out and makes you beautiful again. I'm going to take what's broken. I'm going to take what's missing. I'm going to take what's lacking. I'm going to take the interior. And I, I'm not discarding the interior. I'm remaking the interior of your life so that you will be brought back to your original condition. If you believe that, shout amen. amen. I'm going to reproduce you. I'm going, I'm going to reconstruct you. I'm going to rebuild you. I'm going to give your spirit so much horsepower that your unsafe family will be afraid to sit in the front seat on your ride. Amen. And I'm not trying to say that she ain't safe, so please don't read into what I just said. God said, I'll rebuild your broken walls and your broken lives. I will restore what the enemy has torn down. And I'll restore, I'll re- somebody watch me needs to hear this, I will restore what has even happened in other places of worship, the injury, the emotional damage, the spiritual uh, taking advantage of. And God says, don't give up on me because of one bad seed, for I will rebuild, I will reconstruct, and I will restore you in Jesus' name. Amen. To restore means to heal the shattered dreams and relationships. That God takes what's been broken for so many years. And watch this. He doesn't just put it back together. He makes it better than before. Right? He, Jerry, he was telling me one time about uh, his hot rod truck. And how, how he took out what was in it. And then he souped it up. 
So when you're working on that Mustang, don't forget to soup it up, okay? Uh, uh, he soups he soups it up. He soups up our, it's a weird analogy, but he soups up our spirit. You understand what I'm saying? He doesn't, he doesn't just put us back to where we were. He makes us better than what we were. Amen. 900 horsepower, if you please. <laughs> Amen. I don't know that that's street legal, but it's okay. Heal and restore our shattered dreams and relationships. Finally, to restore means, let me say it this way. He improves what we thought we lost. He improves what we thought we lost. I'm going to take you a step further. He makes up for what we feel we sacrificed to go through what we went through. You can point to that moment, can't you? You can point to that moment. Where something changed in a relationship, in a ministry, in a marriage, in yourself. You can point to that moment and say, I was fine until then. Things were going well until that happened. And the danger is, is that we won't see it as a moment of the activity of the enemy. We see it through the eyes of the individual the enemy used. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this present age. And, and, the, and what the word he's trying to get to us tonight is, is stop focusing on the moment and understand that when the kingdom comes, restoration comes. Amen? How many need some restoration in your life? So I want to do this. Next week, we're going to pick up on three and four. But I want to pray because I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit in this room. I want to pray for people watching online that I believe what God is saying to us tonight is there's coming a revival of restoration. A revival of restoration. Uh, that, that, that no longer will we mourn what was lost. No longer will we mourn what was broken. But we will now look to the restorer. We will look to the redeemer. Amen. That God is our redeemer, he is our restorer, he is our renewer, he is our reviver. And if, and, and if the kingdom is going to be at work, I'm going to say it this way, if the kingdom is going to be at work in our church, it must first be at work in us. Well, I, I, I just want to get to the day where it's just exciting and revival in this place all the time. If it doesn't happen inside... It won't happen outside. And that's what God is saying to us tonight is the key ingredient and the priority must be, number one, to have a heart for people, and number two, if there's something broken in your life, you need to be restored in Jesus' name. Amen? Can we stand together as we pray? Hallelujah. I hope you got something out of this tonight. Amen? I hope you got something to chew on. You had to get your spiritual toothpick and get some meat out your teeth. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lift your hands all over the room, if you will. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for a supernatural move of restoration in this house. I pray for every person in this room that they have things in their life that are broken and damaged and missing. I pray for every person in this room that something is lacking in their lives. I pray, God, for those that are watching online that maybe, maybe sitting there and hearing this word, there are tears in their eyes. There's emotional pain in their heart because of what they've went through. Maybe, God, it wasn't a long time ago. Maybe it's been recent that we speak healing and restoration to each and every person, whether in this building or watching online. We speak restoration for the put back to original state and even better than original. That, Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive an impartation of the grace of God that restores what men have broken. It heals what has been hurting. And it puts back what has been missing. And, Father, tonight, in the name of Jesus, we pray, God, that this would launch the beginning of a turnaround in this house. 
it would launch a, a turnaround, a flipping around of what's been missing or broken or lacking. That we, do, we choose tonight not to look over our shoulders, but we choose tonight to look forward and look upward to know that you are moving in our midst. And now, God, we lift our hands and we praise you. We glorify you. We exalt your holy name because you are doing something great for your people. We pray, God, that each and every person that is struggling would have an encounter with your presence tonight. And as we leave this place tonight, remind us, remind us that we are not going to always be like we are now because you are changing us from the inside out. And Father, I pray that you would give each of us a heart for lost, hurting, and dying humanity every race, every color, every creed, every ethnicity, that they are your children. You are our Father. Give us a heartbeat for souls. Give us a burden to see altars filled with people that are turning their lives over to you. Rescue humanity. Restore humanity. Renew humanity. God, let us not be those that give up on people. Let us be those as we leave tonight to have a newfound, fresh passion to see the lost saved, the healed, the hurt healed, and the bound set free. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming tonight. We'll see everybody Sunday.